Now that you've painted the color wheel, let's take a closer look at color theory. Complementary colors are opposite each other on the color wheel. Red and green are opposites on the color wheel. Red absorbs blue and yellow waves and reflects red. Green absorbs red waves and reflects blue and yellow. All the wavelengths are represented. On the edge where complementary colors meet, mixing a hue with this complement dulls the hue or lowers its intensity. The more a complement you add to a hue, the duller the hue looks. Eventually, the hue will lose its own color quality and appear neutral gray. The hue used in the greatest amount in the mixture becomes dominant. For this reason, a mixture might look dull orange or dull blue, depending upon the amount of color used. Orange and blue mixtures usually yield brownish results. When two colors come into direct contact, the differences increase. A yellow-green surrounded by a green looks yellower. A yellow-green surrounded by yellow seems greener. A grayish green will brighten when it's placed against a gray background. A color scheme is a plan or recipe that helps organize color. Many designers use established color schemes, while an artist might modify the color scheme as needed. The simplest color scheme is monochrome. Monochrome means one color. To paint with monochrome, only use one wedge of the color wheel. Analogous colors are colors that sit side by side on the color wheel and have a common hue. Violet, red violet, red, red orange, and orange all have red in common. A more narrowly related scheme would be limited to only three hues, such as violet, red violet, and red. Complementary colors are exciting. Strong contrast between hues are produced when pairing colors from opposite sides of the color wheel. A complementary scheme is used to grab the viewer's attention. Select any colors opposite each other on the color wheel to use this scheme. Consider muting or toning down bright colors so it's less jarring for the viewer. The color triad is composed of three colors spaced an equal distance apart on the color wheel. The primary triad is made from red, yellow, and blue. The secondary from orange, green, and violet. Here's a look at some of the triads to be found using the color wheel. The cool colors are violet, blue-violet, blue, blue-green, blue, and green. The warm colors are red, red-orange, orange, yellow-orange, and yellow. Yellow-green and red-violet can either be warm or cool, depending upon how they're mixed. You can make a pleasing painting by using any half of the color wheel. A split complement is the combination of one hue plus the hues on each side of this complement. This is easier to work with than a straight complementary color scheme. Start with red-orange and then find its complement blue-green. We won't use blue-green, but we use the two hues next to it, which are green and blue. These three colors form a split complement. Here are some others. A double split complementary scheme is found in a similar way. Start by finding complements and then choose the colors adjacent to each. Here are some double split complements. Now that you can mix colors, we're ready to look at how artists use color. For a long time, artists were valued because of their ability to observe light and mix color accurately. Starting around the 1890s, artists took their paints outside and they started mixing colors based on what they observed. How does shadow affect the way that we perceive color? What about reflections or wind? How does color change with the time of day or with the amount of humidity or moisture in the air? Trying to use color accurately based on your impressions or observations of it is called local color. Careful observation and use of local color inspired artists to begin experimenting with color. As they experimented, they got further and further away from the use of local color, as in these pointillism examples. Pointillism uses intense colors to try to capture the energy of a scene. This use of more intense color allowed artists to eventually abandon local color in exchange for using color symbolically or to capture feeling. When we use color this way, we are using arbitrary color. Thanks to the questioning that came before, we're able to use color locally or arbitrarily or even no color at all in our paintings. Next, let's look at some simple brush techniques we can use to add interest when putting paint on our canvas. The first is called double loaded brush. Dip your shader half in one color and the other half in a different color. This can be a really fun effect, but you have to re-dip your brush often. Another effect is called underpainting. You have to plan ahead and lay down your color and let it dry. We'll come back to this yellow swatch later and show you the effect. If I dip my brush halfway in paint and leave the other half dry, I can put the dry side down and get these wispy effects. This is known as dry brush. Another approach to dry brush is to paint on a scrap paper or paper towel until the paint almost runs out. Then apply this wispy paint to your canvas. Another effect can be achieved by adding water or medium to your paint until it's see-through, similar to watercolor. Washes are translucent and they let the layers beneath show through. Another fun effect is the triple loaded brush. Here I'll use a smaller brush to apply paint to my shader. 
while this is tedious, reloading the brush and careful application can help you achieve some cool results. Now that our underpaint is dry, let's look at some of the effects we can achieve with this technique. First, we can layer one color on top of the underpaint and it shows through. Another approach is called Sgraffito. To use Sgraffito, put wet paint over your underpaint and simply scratch through to reveal the color underneath. This is a great way to add texture to a painting. While there are many other brush techniques, the last one we'll talk about is mixing on the canvas. Simply add a couple hues together and blend them on the canvas, but not completely allowing the brush strokes to show, creating layers, energy, and atmosphere. All of these techniques can be combined for dynamic effects. Now that you know a little bit more about painting, let's take a look at the next assignment, where we'll make a painting of a bird, a landscape, a logo, or a shoe. You're expected to select a color scheme and use some of the brush techniques that we've discussed to make your painting. Remember, the color scheme is just a starting point, and there are more brush techniques than the ones that we've discussed. Feel free to use any or research new ones beyond the ones we've talked about in class. You can paint realistically using local color, as in these examples, or you can use arbitrary color and paint more abstractly, or even go off the map like this cosmic cat does. It will be evaluated on brushwork, color scheme, and creativity. Notice how this artist used the split complement color scheme with red and yellow green and sgraffito for the texture in the leaves. This painting uses underpainting, dry brush, and wash to achieve a nice glow. Compare the use of complementary colors with the yellow eyes and purple background on this owl with the calming yellows of this monochromatic yellow color scheme. Lots of dry brush was used in these two paintings. For these, color was layered over and over again to achieve the intense bright colors in these tropical birds. If you decide to paint a logo, you'll need to redesign it. You need to use a new color scheme, layer some of the brush techniques that we've learned from this assignment, bring your own ideas to the logo, no copies. 